Hi, I'm Pastor Brad Inman, and you're listening to the Orange United Methodist Sermon Podcast. We're a church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, that wants to help you find your place in God's story. And we hope this sermon can guide you along that journey. Visit orangemethodist.org to find out more information about location, service times, upcoming events, and ways to give. We hope you enjoy. We are continuing in our Songs of Summer series, and we are beginning, uh, we are looking at Psalm 111. If you've got your own Bible, I invite you to turn with me, uh, or you can read along on your own device. The, wall, the words will be projected on the screen. They'll also be found for those that are worshiping online on the screen. Psalm 111. Hear now these words. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright in the congregation. Great are the works of the Lord, studied by all who delight in them, full of honor and majesty in his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He has gained renown by his wonderful deeds. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He provides food for those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are faithful and just. All his precepts are trustworthy. They are established forever and ever to be performed with faithfulness and uprightness. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All those who practice it have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks be to God indeed. Let us pray once again. Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Good morning, church. Once again, I am Pastor Corey, in case you were confused. (laughs) Um, But we are. We're excited. We're getting ready to welcome, I guess, nurture, equip, and eventually send. So, uh, but it is good to be together. It's always a joy to be with you this morning. And you're probably familiar with, With that short prayer, I often, and other pastors, often open their sermons with, and you may have wondered, where does that come from? Why why do we say those certain words? And since we're exploring the Psalms in this Songs of Summer series, I thought I'd let you know that that short and simple prayer, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Those words actually come to us from Psalm 19, verse 14. And I tell you that because the Psalms are where so many of our liturgical prayers come from. And the Psalms, they are the lyrics of our communal liturgy. They are the words that have been given to us that we then can give back to God. And as Pastor Adam reflected upon Psalm 130 last week as a Psalm of Ascent, it begins, Out of the depths I cry. Those are words we can speak to God, words of petition and supplication, expressing the painful needs we feel in our heart. Sometimes it's hard to articulate those needs, that pain, but the psalmists, they empower us to speak words already spoken out of the depths. The depths, I cry, Lord, hear my voice. And sometimes we struggle to find those words because we can't even sort through the anguish we're feeling. There's so many parts of feeling like we're in the depths, especially right now as we wake up every morning to new mandates and very unsettling statistics. We feel that anguish of uncertainty. We feel the anger of what we may be losing or have lost again. We feel the sorrow of plans made that now may be undone. We feel the bitterness of decisions that have been made that we weren't necessarily in control of. We feel sadness, just sadness, and we feel scared, and we feel hopeless, and 
We grieve the continued loss of so many lives. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord, hear my voice. And I know uh, I haven't tried to hide that pain this week in my life. All that anguish has kind of seethed out of me. I don't know about you, but I had an opportunity to spend some time with a girlfriend this week. And when I picked her up, I said, I'm really sorry, but it may not be very much fun to hang out with me today. And she said, well, good, that makes two of us. And so we kind of sat in that pit together. As Pastor Adam alluded to last week, we, we sat and we even managed to laugh in the midst of those metaphorical walls. We weren't alone. And that felt like a promise fulfilled. And so when I went to drop her off at home, uh, I'll have to tell you, all of this sudden love and appreciation started kind of to swell in my heart. And I thought for a moment, I should say that. I should tell her. I should just say, I should come out with my heart and say, thank you. Thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being here with me in this pit. But I didn't. I thought it, but I didn't say it. And because I didn't say it, she didn't get to hear it and feel that love and appreciation. And that brings me to this morning's appointed psalm, Psalm 111. Those words at the beginning, they kind of charge out of the gate with a lot of force and a lot of confidence. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. And not only will I give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart, I'm going to do it in front of people, in front of the whole congregation, the upright. And why would I give thanks, the psalmist says? Because great are God's works, full of honor and majesty, his righteousness, his wonderful deeds. God is gracious and merciful. He provides food. He keeps his covenant. His hands are just and upright. God's promises are trustworthy, and they are forever. He is faithful. He has sent us redemption. That's Jesus. And as the psalmist has given us these words to speak back to God, what do they mean to us? Where have we witnessed God's great works on display or God's righteousness prevail? Where have we seen God's mercy and grace poured out? Where has God's provision overwhelmed us in some way? Even now, sitting with those observations and meditations, drawing meaning to those words of praise, it can take real work and real intention. It doesn't necessarily come naturally to us. Just thinking back to that experience I had with my good friend, I could not muster up those simple words of appreciation or praise. I often can't. It's, it's so much easier for me to offer criticism or even lament toward, for instance, Tiagen, my husband than it is for me to offer praise or words of thanksgiving which he, for all that he does, which he so often deserves. I feel myself stifle myself in offering words of praise and thanksgiving because for me they can be more uncomfortable than offering that lament and criticism. Kind of been habituated in that way. We're so much quicker to leave a critical review than a rave review for something we've experienced. We're almost looking for something to go wrong or for the mistake we can point out. If we don't intentionally ponder those attributes of God, those reasons God is so worthy of our praise, then the words we utter as part of our liturgy can lose their significance. They can lose their power and being words we utter back to God with our whole heart. We may utter them with our whole mouth, but they are empty. And we know God does not desire the lavish yet empty words of the Pharisees in Matthew's gospel. Those words are uttered with the mouth, but they do not reflect what lives in our hearts. As I read a few commentaries this week pondering this psalm, one scholar said, this psalm invites us not simply into a liturgy to be said, but into a, a lifestyle to be lived. I'm going to say that again. This psalm invites us not simply into a liturgy 
to be said, but into a lifestyle to be lived. That whole heart piece speaks loudly. The psalm calls us not just into a liturgy of praise, but into a lifestyle of praise. Our adoration and praise of God should be evident in our daily living. When I thought of that word lifestyle, I I don't know why, but my mind immediately went to the voice of the famous Robin Leach uh, hosting the show, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous, and how, really? I thought it was okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, And how people on that show, they, they curate their lives, they curate their homes, their property, in order to communicate what they value. And we can begin to name those things that they value, those things as we travel from room to room in their lavish, over-the-top homes. They value success, wealth, power, fashion, image, and the list goes on. But walking through their lives, at least we know. We know who they are. We know what they value, and they, they want us to know. We're not making assumptions. They have put it on full display. They want us to know who they are. And so I began to think, if I gave someone a tour of my life, and I took them through the rooms of my everyday, and I asked them, now write a liturgy or a song or a psalm based on your observations. I wonder what it might say. What it might reflect is adoration and praise of God with my whole heart reflected in my lifestyle? Does the liturgy I speak in the company of you saints match the life I live? What values does my life reflect? I'm sincerely going to reflect upon that as we are sent out this morning. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. To do anything with one's whole heart takes work and intention and practice. And our ability to praise God with our whole heart doesn't take away from the truth that our hearts have a range of emotions. We give God praise with our happy hearts, with our hurting hearts, with our broken hearts, with our sick hearts. We give God praise with our whole hearts, every part, because of who we have witnessed God to be in every moment of our lives. Praise, thanksgiving, gratitude, they are practices and disciplines. And just like so many, of, so many practices or disciplines, they take consistency and effort and attention and accountability. But we know that through practice and through discipline, we're led into a deeper transformation within ourselves. If you haven't seen the film, A Beautiful Day in the Neighborhood, starring Tom Hanks as Mr. Fred Rogers, I highly recommend it. And the film does take some liberties, but it's very much based upon the person and lifestyle of Fred Rogers, a Presbyterian minister who dedicated his life to provide programming for children to ensure that they thrive mentally and emotionally. The film focuses on an investigative journalist who is tasked with profiling Mr. Rogers for a biography series. And the journalist is beyond annoyed with this assignment because he thinks it is way, way beneath him. (laughs) But as the film progresses, he begins to see that maybe, just maybe, the liturgy that Mr. Rogers preaches with his mouth and his show that liturgy may just actually be the lifestyle he embodies in his everyday. His liturgy and his life might just match. And this moment in the film comes when the journalist is on set standing next to Mr. Rogers' wife, Joanne, and he leans over and he says, so how does it feel to be married to a living saint? And she says, you know, I'm not fond of that term. If you think of him as a saint, then his way of being is unattainable. You know, he works at it all the time. It's a practice. He's not a perfect person. He has a temper. He chooses how he responds to that anger. And the journalist says, well, that must take a lot of effort. 
And she responds, well, yeah. He does things every day that help to ground him. He reads scripture. He swims laps. He prays for people by name. And he writes letters, hundreds of them. It takes work. It's practice. It doesn't always come naturally. Our posture of praise is a posture we choose, a posture we seek out in our discipleship. It is the posture Paul chooses from his prison cell. Allowing our liturgy to become our lifestyle takes practice. We must work at it together in community and personally. To be praisers of God with our whole heart takes intention. It beckons us to pay attention to God's mighty works around us, to pay attention to God's provision around us, to God's grace and mercy in our lives and in the world. It takes boldness, especially today when there is so much that feels like it is keeping us in the depths. We must find practices, those intentional spaces that help us to see and that give meaning to the words we utter in this space. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart. Maybe that practice or space is calling out to you today. Perhaps it's a walk in the woods to see and appreciate God's mighty creation. Perhaps it's sitting with a passage of scripture or attending Sunday school or a small group. Doris Click's class is a great opportunity. Maybe having coffee with a friend just to sit in the pit together. Or finding some quiet time or meditation time, swimming laps, working in the garden, baking bread, writing a letter, serving with porch, sharing words of appreciation with someone. What is a practice that you might engage in this week that would align your lifestyle and this liturgy of praise and adoration for who God is? What is just one practice? And as you seek out that space, I want you to, this is your task, to seek out that space this week. I want you to think about that question. If we took someone on a tour of our lives, what would be the song or the psalm they might write? What would be the liturgy? Let us pray. Wonderful God, creator and friend, we thank you for this remarkable experience of life in its entirety. For all of its highs and lows, its sweet and sour, pleasure and pain. Oh God, we give you thanks. When the sun shines on our days and rain refreshes the land overnight, when there is a bounce in our step and a song on our lips, we give you thanks, O God. When the clouds are low and a chill wind blows, when the day's tasks seem onerous and become, and it becomes an effort to smile, we thank you, O God. When a full moon shines and the night seems like a dear friend, when we go to bed content and sleep deeply and satisfyingly, we will thank you, O God. And when the night is pitch black and our fears leave their hiding places, when we go to bed weary and toss and turn all night, we will give you thanks, O God. When blossom covers the fruit trees and rainbows are in the skies, when our world seems full of promise and our bodies glow with good health, we will give you thanks, O God. And when hail destroys the harvest and floods sweep a bridge away, when ills afflict our bodies and each day is a struggle against pain, we will thank you, O God. When the ocean waves are gentle and bays are like a mirror, when it is easy to have faith and our love flows without effort or cost, we will thank you, O oh God. When the seas are mountainous and ships are in distress, when our faith seems like a flimsy vessel and loving takes a determined commitment, we will thank you, O oh God. And when new creatures are being born and fresh growth seems everywhere, 
when children's laughter rings and young people fall in love, we will thank you, O God. And when age and decay seem all around and dear friends suffer and die, when we grow frail and simple tasks take much time and effort, we will still thank you, O God. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. Please join us again next week. In the meantime, you can find us online at orangemethodist.org.